Well, good morning, Sunnyside. So glad you're here with us today. Hopefully you had an incredible 4th of July weekend. Got to celebrate with some family, some friends, some neighbors, get out a little bit. I know we got to do that with my family uh, in town. So uh, anyway, just want to let you know, uh, miss seeing you. And uh, we're going to be getting together soon. We've been doing a couple of these supplemental events. Uh, we did a, a prayer night a few weeks back. We did a worship night a, a couple weeks back. Both of those were incredible things. Uh, today, after service, after we get together, Together, we're actually going to be encouraging people to meet over at Madison Park, uh, which is just across the street from our church here uh, at 12 o'clock. This is a BYOE, which means bring your own everything. All right. So you need to provide uh, anything that you want to bring blankets, you know, yeah, Frisbees, if you want to bring those things, activities. We're still going to try to encourage some social distancing in terms of how set up and everything else goes. But ultimately, we're just meeting at the park so we can hang out and see each other. Uh, one thing we did want to let you know is that we're going to have a hot dog truck on our property um, so that if you don't want to bring some food and you want to just purchase it from them, um, it's somebody who actually goes here uh, from our church and they're going to be providing that. So we want to encourage you guys to park here at uh, Sunnyside's parking lot and then you can just kind of hightail it over the street and set up camp over there. Again, we'll be hanging out there around 12 o'clock. Um, you know, Hopefully we have good weather, but uh, even if, if we don't, uh, you know, plan on coming and hanging out for a little bit, uh, we'll be sending some stuff out via email so you can kind of keep your eyes out for that. One other thing I want to keep you guys posted on, we made a determination through the end of June to make sure that we're still doing online only, keeping people safe, also trying to do these things in groups. And so we have an update to that. Had an elders meeting a, 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 about a week and a half ago, wanted to let you guys know what we've decided is that we're actually gonna open up this facility on July 19th. Anybody else excited? I am. And so uh, we're going to open up the facility on the 19th. Now, here's the deal. Uh, the, first, the, the last two weeks of July, when we open this thing up, uh, we're going to be easing into this. We're not ma making this public to everybody else. Uh, we're just letting you guys know about this. Uh, we're going to ease into it a little bit. We still have th some kinks to work out in terms of how to do simulcast and all that kind of stuff on Sunday mornings. So it's going to be a little bit different. Expect some stuff different. Look for your emails. We're going to be communicating how we're going to be doing uh, things with kids and what we can do and up to what age and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but for right now, at least mark your calendars. July 19th, we'll be back in this facility. Looking to August 5th is kind of being more of our grand reopening, getting back to doing some stuff here. We will continue to do online stuff. So don't worry about that. We'll continue to do online stuff, but we will start to meet here in the facility starting on the 19th. So with that being said, let's pray and we'll jump into the rest of our service today. So Father, thank you for giving us the privilege and the opportunity and the technology to continue to be able to do this. Uh, many people are watching this from not where they typically watch it from um, because of this weekend, yet they are able to stay engaged with what's going on here. So we thank you for that. Pray that you'd be with the words that Eric is gonna speak to us today and that we'd better understand what your cross accomplished. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Imagine you're a writer and your publisher asks you to write a book based on a high profile kidnapping. Now, I really mean this. Just, just think if you're a writer, where would you start? And I want you to go ahead and be a little bit creative. And the first place I would start would be thinking about the movies that I've already seen, maybe a novel that I've read about kidnapping or hostages and ransom notes and all of that, the documentaries and so forth that are on, on television. Um, and, and you kind of go through this step, this process, it's almost prescribed. There's the horror of finding out that someone was kidnapped, you know. Uh, and then you see the police fill the living room and they, all these guys, they got their briefcases and the headphones on and they're ready for a phone call and to trace that phone call, got all their gadgets and gizmos and so, so forth. And then someone finds the all important ransom note, okay. Um, and then, you know, everybody's just sitting there around waiting in the living room for that phone call. And when the phone call comes, it's usually a garbled voice, you know, it's been masked, stating that something bad is going to happen if his demands for ransom are not met. Okay, so again, this is a story you're supposed to write. So now as a writer, you go back to journalism class and you remember the five W's. I was taught the five W's in journalism class and then we had a sixth question that we asked. But in any kind of investigative type story or report or even problem solving, you ask these five W's. Who, what, where, when, and why? And then the sixth question is simply, how? So let me give you the high profile case, case to start with. The high profile case that you're gonna be writing about is you. You see, because you've been imprisoned. It happened when you sinned against God, your creator. You went against his will for your life. And what that did was that separated you from him. And now a ransom is required for your freedom. And the ransom note is found in the Bible. It's in the book of Romans, the sixth chapter. Romans chapter six, you might've read this before, verse 23. And it goes like this. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, what he's saying there, folks, is that bad things are going to happen if the demands of the ransom are not met. Now, we've already been talking about this in this sermon series. As a matter of fact, just last week, Corey talked extensively about uh, those bad things and uh, the blood of Christ being required and, and why and so forth. And the, the sermon series that we're in is called Cross Examine. And we're examining the purpose of the cross of Jesus, asking the most important question in the world, why the cross? Well, the sermon series went like this. It started out because the cross saves me. We all, we all know that. We all know that we need that as Christians. And so the cross saves us. That's the purpose of the cross, right? 
but also it reconciles me. Third was it adopts me. And then last week, as I mentioned, it redeems me. Today, I'm going to deal with one more reason for the cross, and that is it, now listen to this, it ransoms me. And I'm going to put the sign up right now on the cross so we won't forget that today. The idea of being ransomed is all through the scripture. You can't miss it. And there's a reason that God wanted us to see this and understand this. You see, because apart from Christ before, I was imprisoned. But because of the cross, I'm now free. And what we've been talking about this whole time, they're all expressions of the gospel or the good news. Uh, the good news that Jesus came not only just to save us, but to give us all of these under, other wonderful and beautiful gifts. And, and Jesus uh, one time uh, was, was, was hinting at this when he was teaching his disciples. He had 12 disciples that were following him around on the subject of humility and servanthood and leadership. Now, what Jesus did oftentimes was uh, he would just take everyday events, questions, uh, things that they would see in nature even and teach on it. Yeah, he was a great teacher that way. And towards the end of his ministry, he was um, headed to Jerusalem for the final week. And before he got to Jerusalem and uh, partook in what we call the, the triumphal entry, there was an interesting event that happened between him and his 12 disciples. He had been teaching about even his death and why he was going to Jerusalem. I don't think they had any idea of what that was all about at that point. But he was teaching them so they would look back on it and remember it. And he was uh, teaching on a lot of other things, just anytime something came up. And they were beginning to think about the future. They were beginning to think what the kingdom was like, because he was hinting at it. And so two of the guys named James and John, two brothers, sons of Zebedee, began to wonder about what their place and their position was going to be in that future kingdom. And believe it or not, they had enough gall to go and ask Jesus Hey, listen, when that time comes, when it happens, and, and you're king of kings and lord of lords and all of that, can I have one place on your side and my brother have the other place on your side? We, we know also that in another version of this story, their mom even asked this. Can you imagine that? And Jesus had to sit him down and say, and this is where he, he took the opportunity, he made this a teachable moment, and he said, listen, guys, that's not how it works in the kingdom. As a matter of fact, it's, it's quite different than what you're thinking. And it's not going to be like that at all. And, and, and even the other 10 of the disciples kind of heard what was going on. And, and uh, they got a little ticked off at James and John and said, Hey, listen, guys, what are you doing? And Jesus said, listen, guys, gather up. So he gathers all 12 of them together. And he says, let me tell you something. You guys are used to leadership um, in a way that's, that's completely foreign to the kingdom. As a matter of fact, the Romans that, that you observe mostly around in Jerusalem, they have an idea of leadership that is uh, authoritarian. And uh, they, they take leadership by force, kind of the survival of the fittest, if you will. And that's how they lead. The strongest man wins. In the kingdom, it's not like that. Whoever wants to be a leader in my kingdom, whoever wants to be someone who is a person of influence, has to first of all become, he uses the word servant. And then he uses another word. He said, and if you want to be really good, if you want to be the first as a leader, you have to become, and he uses this word, slave, which is slightly different than servant. A servant is someone who might say, you know, I'll work for you, but I'll do all the menial tasks. I'll wait tables. I'll do whatever it is that you need me to do. I'll be your butler, whatever it is. That's kind of a servant. But a slave is, is another Greek word. Doulos is that word. And it, mean, it means someone who is actually owned by someone else. And Jesus goes to the point of using both words and say, that's what leadership looks like in my kingdom. It's not a matter of honor or position of who's on my right, who's on my left. It's a matter of servanthood. And then he gives them what I call a real zinger. Uh, after he explains all that in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, he says, I'm going to set the example for you in this. And this is how he does it. He says, for even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life, catch this, as a ransom for many. I want you to remember that word ransom. 
Let's kind of go back to our story um, that we're telling. How are you going to tell your story? I, I want to start with those essentials, five W's, and then maybe the sixth question, how. First of all, who? Who is this story about? Well, very simply, it's about me and you. It's our life. It's our journey. It's our walk in this world. Um, it's, our, it's our fall. It's our rising. It's maybe our fall again and our rising again. It's all the ups and downs. It's just life. That's, that's who this story is about. What is at stake here is, as I mentioned, our ransom and our freedom. Now, when did this story take place? Well, it, it took place thousands of years ago, 33 AD, as a matter of fact. And where? It was at a place outside of the city of Jerusalem on a hill called Golgotha or the place of the skull where Jesus was crucified. And the why part of our story, very important here. The why is because God required it. A lot of people kind of have this false notion that it was Satan that took us captive and held us and that he is requiring this ransom. And he is telling God, you've got to pay me blood to get these people back. And that is not true at all. It is not Satan that requires the ransom. It is God. He wants to have fellowship with us. He wants to be with us, but he can't because of our sin and because of the separation that we've been talking about throughout this series. He just can't be with us without the ransom being paid. And so it is God that is requiring it. He didn't come to, to pay off Satan. He came to destroy Satan which he did on the cross. Which leads me to the sixth question of how, how this happened. A ransom was paid through the cross. And so that's what I wanna share with you this morning. And it's important for us really during this time to grasp the significance of the freedom that we have when the ransom has been paid. Because that's what's at stake in this story and how precious it is and, and how we uh, shouldn't, should never take it for granted. Now, we understand this as, uh, as Americans, right? Because on the 4th of July, uh, coming up here real quick, we're going to celebrate our freedom as Americans, right? We're also um, uh, every year celebrating those who paid the ultimate or the high cost for our freedom on Memorial Day. So freedom is, is really something that we cherish to the point of being willing to die for it in a political sense. Uh, Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death. You remember that quote? And liberty is just really the responsible use of freedom. And that phrase about liberty and being willing to die for it is used all over the world, going way back to the Scots when they were fighting for their freedom from, from the British colony, to the national motto of Greece today, in, in Chile, in Paraguay, people use that phrase, men yearn to be free. And when it's taken away, bad things happen. So here's, here's my big idea that I want to share with you today is that hopefully by looking at some of these scriptures and understanding what Jesus did when he paid our ransom, we should, now here it is, never lose the preciousness of our freedom, okay? Never lose the preciousness of your freedom. Now I have a friend who lost his freedom for 14 years. He, he was supposed to be for the rest of his life, but God intervened in Walt's life and a sentence that was supposed to be for life was miraculously overturned. And today uh, he has his family back. He has a thriving business and he's following Christ in a new and living way. Now, I've heard Walt tell his story to a lot of folks, to men's groups, to AA groups. I've heard him tell it here at Sunnyside over the years. And I even was with him in a men's prison in Ethiopia where over 500 men uh, kind of crammed into this room. It was hot. I, I remember it very well. And, and Walt gave his story and his testimony about receiving freedom in Christ. But what I did was I, I sat down with Walt recently and talked to him specifically about what his time in prison, those 14 years, taught him specifically about freedom and what freedom means to him now. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I am sitting here with Walt Hall, uh, part of our church here. He works with the missions team. He's been involved in a lot of different things. He um, is a good friend of mine. I've known him for many, many years. And if you've never heard Walt and Diane's testimony, you need to check that out sometime. We appreciate him being here with me today and telling a little bit of his story, just a little bit, as it relates to freedom and being ransomed by Christ. He was in 
prison uh, and uh, actually got a life sentence, but through a miracle of God, got out after 14 years of that. And uh, you've been out how many years now, Walt? Um, 15, 14 years. 14 years now. So and so, uh, he's been able to tell his testimony uh, a number of places, uh, including here at the church and all over the world. And uh, he's got a great story to tell, but uh, he's very humble and gives God all the glory. And so we're going to go into a little bit of that today. So thanks for being here and thank you for being here, Walt. Appreciate yeah. it. What was it like, Walt, when you heard the judge put his gavel down and say, life sentence? What went through your mind? So when he said, uh, you are hereby now remanded to the Department of Corrections for the remainder of your natural life, um, my heart fell through the floor. I heard my kids and my wife crying and I turned around and saw them uncontrollably crying and screaming. And um, I knew at that point that, that I had done ser something seriously wrong and that life was probably over as I knew it. So you, you kind of had, had lost hope at that point. I did, yep, yep. Yeah. So when you started your career in prison, a life sentence, basically, um, when it comes to freedom, because we're talking about freedom today, what was the worst part of losing your freedom that as the years kind of went on that you felt? Uh, not being able to make uh, decisions and be able to go outside when I, when I want to 